back in Leviticus tonight, and people say, oh, it's Leviticus. No, this is exciting stuff that we're looking at tonight in Leviticus chapter 23. So why don't you open your Bibles to Leviticus 23, and we'll pray. Father, thank you so much for this time that we can come together tonight, that we can praise your name, that we can uh, rejoice in the things that Jesus has done and the things that Jesus will continue to do. And we look forward to the day that we do see him face to face. And until that day, Lord, help us uh, still look to our Jesus even now, our living Savior. Thank you. Thank you for sending him for us. Teach us, Lord, by your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going to take the time right now to silence my cell phone because I didn't realize I was still on. So there we go. I set the example. So you silence your cell phones too. Leviticus chapter 23 tonight. Hope you have your Bibles open to that. You know, um, we like family times, and scheduled family times are important. As much as we would like that, you know, that our times with our families would just spring out of nowhere, and we would just have all kinds of time with our, our loved ones apart from the calendar, reality dictates the need that we actually have to schedule some of this time in. If we don't purposefully intentionally uh, spend and schedule time with our family, then, you know, it often just does not happen. Uh, many of you guys know that for our family, it's Friday nights. Friday nights have always been our time that we set aside for our family night. That's the reason why we typically don't go anywhere despite invitations on Friday night. Unless you're getting married or getting buried, uh, that's pretty much the only times we'll, we'll leave on a Friday night to go and do church things. So that's our family night. And if we do that with our families, then it should come as no surprise that God does that with His own, as seen with the children of Israel. The God who dwelled among His people at His tabernacle set time aside in the calendar to spend time with the people among whom He dwelled. Uh, more to the point, God not only did that for them, but He commanded His people to put appointments in their weekly calendars and their annual calendars to spend time with him. After all, God was already there. It was the hearts of the people that had a tendency to wander, even though God was right there in the midst, just like it is with us. And so this is really what the feasts were about, this scheduled time with the Lord. Now, to catch us up where we are, having given instruction to the Hebrews on you know, the, the regular sacrifices, having given instruction to the Hebrews on God's standard on holiness and cleanliness and God's expectation for priestly homes, he turns his attention in these kind of closing chapters to priestly acts. He's starting to wind down the book of Leviticus. It's going to take us several chapters to get there, but we're on the way. And he starts to wind it down here. You might remember, although, that the book it ha does have a lot of instruction to the Levitical priests, priests from the tribe of Levi. It's not really so much the book, a, a, a handbook to priests, as it is a description of God's holiness and how God's people can worship him in holiness. And part of this instruction includes the various feasts of Israel. Now, there have been a lot that was written regarding worship, a lot that was written regarding sacrifices, but there were other times when God called the nation to worship as a whole. It wasn't just individual Hebrews coming to God. It was the corporate nation of Israel. And God mercifully, in His grace, desired and wanted to meet with the nation and so these feasts were his chosen way of how to do it. Through the feasts, God invites his people to meet with him, and because of his grace, he actually did it. Now, if that's all there was, there would be reason enough to study the Feast of Israel. If all we had about the feast was a basic listing in our Bibles, that would be worthy of study just because this is the Word of God. But there's more, because the Feast of Israel have a direct tie to the work of Jesus, and God's plan for the church and Israel as we know together, we are together, his covenant people. The Feast of Israel reveal God's plans for the ages, and his plan is wonderful. And what we'll see is that Jesus fulfills it all. In the end, what we see of the feast relationship to Jesus is really the same thing we see to ancient Israel. God wants to meet with his people, and he gives us the invitation and the grace to do it. So we ask ourselves as we prepare to get into this tonight, will we do it? Are we going to meet with God? How, how do we do it? Uh, we'll see it kind of in three sections here. First, we'll meet with God and remember Jesus regularly, regularly 
We'll remember what Jesus has done, and then we'll remember what Jesus will do. It actually starts off, though, with just a brief word of introduction, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. First things first, and that's the fact that we need to provide here some definitions. If we are going to talk repeatedly about feasts and convocations, and we are, this particular word for feast is used six times in Leviticus chapter 23. This particular word for convocations is used 11 times in this chapter. If we're going to use those words so often, we ought to know what they mean. Well, this first word for feast refers not so much to a meal. It really refers to an appointed time. It could be a specific place. It could refer to a, a set calendar-based festival. But overall, it refers to an appointed meeting. An agreed upon time, moed, this word feast that we have here. It's really, you could say these are the appointed times of God to Israel. The second word, convocations, is derived from a Hebrew word meaning to call or to proclaim or even to read. And this refers to an assembly or a reading almost exclusively for religious reasons. That's what this convocation was. So you put it together and we find specific times designated in the calendar for God's people to be gathered together and gathered around and according to God's word. These feasts are more than just national holidays in the lives of the Israelites. They're to be holy times of worship dedicated unto God. And even when we think of the English term holiday, originally that refers to a holy day. Now we've tended to lose that in our own culture. Instead of celebrating the work of God on holidays, we celebrate the joy in our barbecue grills. Now, nothing wrong with that. And the fact that there's nothing wrong with joy or celebration, many of the Hebrew feasts were filled with joy, meant to be festivals of rejoicing. But there's quite a bit wrong with it when our Lord God isn't invited to be a part of those times. Christmas, as we know, has become about Santa Claus, gifts and food. Easter has been about bunnies and chocolate. You know, we might expect people to forget the reasons behind Thanksgiving and Memorial Day, as sad as it is when people do forget the reasons behind those days. But even with what should be explicitly Christian holidays, the holy is left out, and it's just a day. If God set aside time for His people to worship Him, guys, that's something to be treasured. God has no reason that he should invite us to spend time in his presence. He doesn't need us for that. God is in need of nothing, and apart from Jesus, we're not worthy to offer him anything. But God graciously wants to spend time with us. He desires for us to spend time with him. So we ought to do it. As for Israel, the specific holidays were spread throughout the year in three basic groups. First were the weekly feast. Then you have the spring feasts and the fall feasts. We start with the weekly feast, the one. It's the Sabbath here in verse 3. And this is where we would remember Jesus regularly. Verse 3 says this, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, it might surprise some that a description of the Feast of Israel would begin with a discussion of the Sabbath, but when we stop to think about it, it really does make a lot of sense. Because if the feast were times appointed by God for His people to gather to Him and to hear His Word, then the weekly Sabbath fits the bill pretty well. Because every week, every single Hebrew man, woman, and child had the opportunity, and really the command, to cease from all work, and to devote him or herself to the worship of God, which included the reading or listening to of Scripture and spending time in prayer. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? If it sounds like a gift, that's because it was. It was never supposed to be this legalistic thing that it developed to over the years. As Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, Mark 2.27. It was meant to be enjoyed as a time to freely worship God, not a burden to try to wriggle one's way out of. It says here, and we've seen this several times before, is that the Sabbath is on the seventh day. In other words, it's Saturday. There are, on occasions, high and holy Sabbaths, in addition to the seventh day we find in the Scripture. But as a whole, Scripture shows Saturday as the Sabbath, without one verse in the New Testament showing a move from the seventh 
to the first day. Now it shows the day of worship moving from the seventh to the first day, but it does not show the Sabbath moving from the seventh to the first day. Now, does that distinction matter? Well, yes, it does, because the Sabbath doesn't change. Why is that? The Sabbath is rooted in God. God does not change. The Sabbath doesn't change because Jesus has fulfilled the requirement of work on the cross and it's the true fulfillment of Sabbath rest. That's faith in Christ alone. So no, that doesn't change at all. In fact, a bit of that is really hinted at here, showing that the seventh day Sabbath is a Sabbath of solemn rest. And if you would look at the grammatical construction in Hebrew, it repeats the word for Sabbath here. You might think of it as a Sabbath of Sabbaths, with the emphasis being on this rest, this cessation from work. Emphatically here, just like God ceased from his work after six days of creation, his people are to cease from their work, but the only way to truly stop working is to get to a place where the work is finished. Where is the work finished? Where Jesus proclaimed it was finished at the cross. It is finished to Telestai, John 1930. When we rest, we rest in Jesus. Question, how often do we rest in Jesus? Always. Always. This is not one day a week for the Christian. This is 24-7 for the Christian. Not just when you come to church on Sundays or Wednesday nights. Our, our whole relationship with God is based on the work of Jesus and faith in what he's done. So we rest in him always. We rest in him regularly. We remember him regularly. Every day we wake up is another day that we can thank God for Jesus and rest in what Christ has done for us. Now, can we and should we do that on Sundays and Wednesdays and various other times? Of course we should, but we should also do it Monday through Saturday and every other day in between too. Now, that all being said, it is good to have a habit of worship. Part of the blessing of this weekly Sabbath was time that was dedicated unto the Lord. You know, sometimes in our freedom from legalistic Sabbatarianism, I think we've tended to throw the baby out with the bathwater and we don't give ourselves any regular time of dedicated worship. And again, we go back to what we started with. If we don't make time for this in our schedule, our schedule has a way of filling itself out. And so we want to make that time. All right, so that was the weekly feast, one, but obviously it happened 52 times a year. Then there are the spring feasts in verses 4 through 22. And this is from our perspective, where we would remember what Christ has done. Remember what Jesus did. Starting in verse 4, These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Now the first feast is foundational. This is the Passover. It happened on Nisan or Aviv, depending on if, uh, which translation of the month you're looking at. Uh, 14, and I've got this chart up here that we'll refer to quite a bit tonight. You can follow along there. The Passover, and you can see Nisan there, and where it says Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. Without the Passover, the nation of Israel would not exist. The Hebrews would have still been slaves in Egypt. Eventually, they would have been bred out of existence. When Jacob's family first went down into Egypt, you recall, it was with the promise that God would bring them out again. And the Passover was the fulfillment of God's word. This was the event in which God purchased the redemption of his people with the blood of the firstborn lambs over the doorpost of their homes as a price. We remember all that study from Exodus. Without question, Passover finds its ultimate fulfillment in the cross of Christ. Jesus died as a Passover sacrifice, and John the Baptist proclaimed him to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1.29. And just as the Passover was foundational to the Hebrews, the cross is foundational to us. We have zero relationship with God outside of it. Without faith in Jesus as our sacrificial substitute, then we have no payment for our sins against God. We have no redemption out of slavery, out of death. We have nothing. We meet people all the time that say, well, I've got my own agreement. I've got my own relationship with the guy upstairs. But they're just kidding themselves because without Jesus, we have nothing. No one does. He alone is our hope because he alone is sufficient to pay the price on our account. And before you go any farther tonight, you need to ask yourself if you believe this. If you put faith, your faith, in Jesus. You believed in him alone as the sacrifice for your sins, your Passover lamb. 
second feast follows straight on the heels of the first. It's often incorporated with it, verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So Nisan 15 through 22 is unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. In the days leading up to Passover, you might recall God commanded the Hebrews to purge their homes of all leaven, of all yeast. Now, uh, we know that many times yeast or leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible due to how easily it grows. Paul's referenced this a few times in the New Testament when he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump, as he mentioned in Galatians 5, verse 9. But the use of leaven in bread, when you're using it to bake bread back in those days, implied time that was needed for the dough to rise. Time that, when God commanded this, the Hebrews did not have. They had to be ready to leave Egypt at any time. They had to be ready to leave Egypt immediately. They didn't know when God was going to call them out, so their bread had to be yeast-free. Not gluten-free. That's something different that we struggle with today. Yeast-free. No leaven in it. Now, in addition to the removal of leaven, there's also the daily offering, it says here, for seven days. A constant emphasis on sacrifice. Blood required as payment for sin for seven full days. And also, no work is to be done the first day or the seventh day. So as the feast began and ended, the attention of the Hebrews are fixed solely on the Lord God. Okay, so we've looked at Passover being fulfilled in Christ. How does the Feast of Unleavened Bread point to Christ? Scholars differ because the, the, the symbolism on here, the fulfillment of this type, isn't nearly as clear as either the Passover, which precedes it by one day, or first fruits, uh, which immediately follows. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, some scholars simply lump Passover and unleavened bread together. And you see that a little bit in the scriptures done, uh, used almost interchangeably. Others see the purging of leaven pictured in the holiness of the church, the holiness of the Christian walk. And that's a possibility, but of course the question becomes again how that's specifically linked with Jesus, considering that it falls between Passover and first fruits, which have very definite ties to his ministry. Others see the sinlessness of Jesus pictured in unleavened bread. And Personally, I believe that's best. When Jesus died on the cross at Passover, he went in the tomb still innocent during unleavened bread. He may have been crucified with robbers, but he himself was without spot or blemish. And it's only because of his true, pure innocence that his blood cleanses us from all sin. We become now pure, spotless, and innocent, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We have his righteousness. So these first two feasts aren't the only one to follow so closely together. You had the uh, uh, Passover, then immediately the next day, unleavened bread. The third came right on the heels of the first two. And you can see it here as it comes in. Verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land which I give to you, and reap its harvest, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest." Now, we'll get to the timing in a minute, but note from Israel's perspective, this is their first future feast. The Feast of first fruits could not be celebrated in the wilderness when God gave this command through Moses. They were to observe it when you come into the land. They're not in the land yet. This is a promise in the midst of being fulfilled, because while wandering in the wilderness, they don't have time to plant crops, much less tend to them, or wait around long enough to come back and harvest them later on, Right? But this is something that would happen. It was only a matter of time. And, of course, they had God's promise on the matter, so it would happen. But when God did give them the land, when they finally had the opportunity to plant crops, what would they do when the harvest came to pass? Well, they bring these first fruits, you might translate this, or the beginnings, the chief of the crops, the head comes from the same root word that we get rosh, head from. You bring that to God and give thanks. They bind up a, a bunch of the harvest, in this case probably barley for this time of year, hand it to the priest, and the priest would take it to the Lord. In verse 11, he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil. 
an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. His drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Now, with the sheaf of barley or grain is offered a lamb, more grain, this time ground into flour, and a drink offering. Now, the sheaf of barley, that's only waved before the Lord, right? The priest takes it and waves it before the Lord. Presumably, it remained with the priest afterwards. The rest, though, is given in fire or it's poured out on the ground, like the drink offering. You pour it out on the ground. You're not going to pour wine onto a, a blazing fire. That's not going to be very wise. It's a recognition that the harvest had come solely by the blessing of God because he kept his promises to Israel. They would have nothing without him, so they give the first and the best back to him. And there's also a restriction, you notice. They're not to eat of their harvested grain until they first thanked God with a gift of grain. The first belonged to the Lord, and none belonged to themselves before they gave God what was his. Now, technically, all the grain was his. God simply allowed Israel to keep the vast majority of it. Their gift to him is a recognition of his gifts back to them. So their attitude regarding this really isn't too different from our attitude or what it should be regarding financial giving. When was it celebrated? Well, it was celebrated the day after the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath what? What had been the previous Sabbath in the context of the previous week, Passover, unleavened bread? So it could very easily begin before the second feast had ended. If Passover fell on a Thursday, Friday, you know, evening to evening, Nisan 14, then first fruits would begin Saturday to Sunday after that Sabbath, right? Evening to even Nisan 16. By the way, that's exactly what happened with Jesus' death and resurrection. Because you had Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. How did Paul describe Jesus to the Corinthians? Regarding the resurrection, he said he's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. One day we will be raised just as Jesus was first raised. Though we may be dead, buried, cremated, dust scattered to the wind, those who have died prior to the rapture of the church will have their bodies physically resurrected by God and restored to glorious new and eternal life. How do we know? Because Jesus was raised and he's the first fruits of the harvest to come. By the way, this emphasizes to the non-believer that he or she doesn't have time to waste when it comes to putting faith in Christ. You start to put this together because if Jesus has fulfilled the work of God, the Sabbath, by him becoming the Lamb of God, the Passover, because he alone is sinless in the sight of God, unleavened bread, and he is shown as being acceptable to God by being first raised from the dead, first fruits. That points and paints a great picture that he's our only hope. A lot of evidence he's our only hope. We cannot be saved through our own work or through the works of other religion. The scripture points only to Christ. It's in him we've got to place our faith. So those are the spring feasts, all those things that have already been done by Jesus. Well, they're not quite over yet, though. There, there's one more that remains. Look at verse 15. And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. So this is the Feast of Weeks, sometimes known as the Hebrew name Shavuot, or we would know it most often as Pentecost. And this came in another month, of course, Sivan 15. You can see in our own calendar in 2019, we're not too far away from that celebration there. This is a secondary harvest celebration declaring Israel's ongoing dependency upon the Lord. Later becomes known as the celebration for receiving the Ten Commandments by the hand of Moses off Mount Sinai. Now, it is certainly possible that Moses did receive the law from God on the same day, but honestly, from the scriptures, we're not told when that happened. All the text specifically describes about Pentecost in the Old Testament is that this is a new grain offering or a secondary spring harvest festival. Uh, the, the harvest of uh, barley was celebrated earlier. This would have been the harvest of wheat in this time of year. Verse 17, You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah, they shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. 
and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull, two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings, an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats as a sin offering and two male lambs of the first year as a sacrifice of a peace offering. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Now we see here some interesting developments from the earlier feasts. Here, there's not just a single sheaf of just cut grain stalks brought to the Lord. We have two loaves of fully cooked bread and leavened bread at that. This is with leaven. Here the emphasis is not on purging out the yeast, is the acknowledgement of the yeast in the daily food of the Hebrews. Additionally, there's a lot of animal sacrifices. There's 10 animals brought together for burnt offerings. And with that, they've got their accompanying grain and drink offerings, flour that's going to be burned on the altar and wine that's going to be poured on the ground. And then there's three additional animals, a sin and peace offerings. 13 animals altogether, plus the other flour and the wine. This is an expensive feast for the average Hebrew. Why so much sacrifice? Because God's blessing comes through blood. And all blood that's shed in the Old Testament is indicative of the blood of Jesus. Understand that even when we're not thinking of our initial salvation, like Passover or the cross, we we'll call our minds. Even if we're just thinking of our ongoing relationship with God, all of that still is due, what? Solely to the cross. We can never forget the blood that was shed for us. And so blood is shed over and over and over again in the Old Testament, constantly reminding them of the price of sin, reminding us of Jesus and the cross for us. Now, how does Pentecost relate to the, the work of Christ? Well, the New Testament plainly shows this fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 on what we think of as the day of Pentecost with the arrival and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's on that day that God the Holy Spirit came upon the church, empowering the disciples to be witnesses of Jesus, just like if we think of the giving of the Ten Commandments, it empowered and equipped the Hebrews to live as the people of God. It was on the day of Pentecost that blessing came upon the church, just like those two baked loaves of bread symbolize the fulfilled blessing of God upon Israel, because now they're feasting in the land. It's on Pentecost that the church saw its ongoing dependence on the work of the power of of God, just as is emphasized here in the Feast of Weeks. By the way, although Jesus has fully completed the first three feasts, although the Spirit has historically come, His work of empowerment does continue to this day. Now, the historical day of Pentecost will never be repented, uh, re repeated, I should say. But any born-again Christian can experience a personal Pentecost the first time he or she asked to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that promise is available to every believer. Now, before we get to the fall feast, just one quick break is taken for a bit of a side note. Verse 22, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord. You know, with all the talk about the harvest celebrations, it was worth reminding the Hebrews about an important point of how to harvest. How to harvest is that they need to be compassionate in their harvesting. Hebrews were free to harvest whatever the Lord gave them, all this increase, reap the benefits of their, their long labors, but they're not to be selfish and stingy with it. Everything they had was stuff that was given them by God, and so they're to leave a little bit back, not to pick off every last grain, not to pick off every last fruit, nor that the poor may have food. Now, the poor would have to go and they'd have to work for the food. It wasn't just boxed up and handed to them. They'd have to wander through the fields and glean what they could find. But the Hebrew farmers was to at least leave something for them to find in the first place. It does bring up a good point in regards to the feast, because it's, it's hypocritical for us to bring our worship to God while we harbor disdain for our neighbor. If the Hebrews were going to show their love for God in worship, they also needed to show their love for others through their compassion and through their mercy. Of course, we're no different in that. All right, so we put all this together so far. There was a weekly feast of the Sabbath, where the Hebrews saw their regular need for God. We regularly remember Jesus. There were the spring feasts where the Hebrews looked to God for their provision. We, of course, remember what God has already done through Jesus. Then there's the fall feasts, 
and they continue to look to God for the rest of the year. Now, the fall feasts take up the remainder of the chapter, verse 23 through 44. This is where we, though, will remember what Jesus will do. Starting in verse 23, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So we go from the spring all the way down to the fall here, and we get to the Feast of Trumpets in the month of Tishri, uh, day one. You know, it's interesting that the, the actual Hebrew word for trumpets, normally we think of shofar, is not listed here. It's not specified here. Uh, the, the blowing of trumpets is a, is a way of expressing one Hebrew word that could imply a trumpet blast, but it also could imply a, a shout of alarm. It could talk about a war cry, even. Now, no doubt in history, trumpets were used in this process, getting the attention of the people, preparing them for the worship that's to take place, but it's just interesting that the actual word for trumpet isn't used. Now, no specific offerings other than a general offering are mentioned here in Leviticus, but don't think that there was nothing going on. There's quite a few that are listed when we'll see it in Numbers chapter 28, verses 1 through 6. But at this point, it's really only the day that's mentioned, both the feast, this point in time, that really kicks off the fall festivals that come right in a row. What do we know about this cry, this sound of the feast? Well, it called the people together. It called the people to attention. It called them to gather. Now, this looks to the future work of Christ because it seems to point to the rapture of the church. Although we don't know either the day or the hour, there will come a point in time when Jesus will descend from heaven to call his people back to himself. Whether we be dead or alive, we will go to meet the Lord in the air. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now you might know that Christians debate the timing of these events quite often. But the prophecy itself remains unchanged. The dead and alive in Christ will one day hear the tr trump, the shout of Jesus and will be raised to be with him forever, that where he is, we may also be. Just as Jesus promised in John 14, verse 3. That's a glorious promise. The Feast of Trumpets. Ten days following the Feast of Trumpets comes the next feast. Verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening till evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Talking here about the Day of Atonement, Tishri, Day 10. Now, much has already been written about the ceremonies of the Day of Atonement. We saw that back in Leviticus chapter 16. So we're not going to revisit all of those right now. Here the emphasis isn't so much on what the priests need to do that day and all those rituals and ceremonies. It's what the people should be doing. What should the attitudes of the people be? This is intended as a day of humbling a day of affliction. Now, other feasts were times for celebration and joy. We'll get to one of those when it comes to the tabernacle. But this was a time for reflection. And there were consequences for neglecting this reflection. If there was no humbling, God said, I'm going to cut you off. If there's no humbling, there's no blessing. If there's no humbling, there's no relationship with God. The Day of Atonement was that important. It was pictured as being crucial to Israel's ongoing relationship with God. As crucial with that as Passover was with their beginning of the relationship with God. The idea is for them to have one full day of affliction without any work of any kind. The people are to cease from their work 
to remember God's work. There was a price for their sin, and that price was paid by God. Now, question. If Passover already points to the sacrificial work on the cross, why does the Day of Atonement seemingly do something similar? Because the cross is that central to our faith. Without Jesus dying on the cross, we have nothing with God. It's only through Jesus' death on the cross that we can meet with God at all and know Him as our Heavenly Father. So there can never be too much emphasis on the cross. People will have a lot of complaints about my preaching, I know. But the moment I hear too much preaching about the cross, is that well, that's a complaint I can ignore. <laughs> there can never be too much preaching and emphasis on the cross. By the way, is there a parallel of the Day of Atonement to the future? Yes, there is, actually. We see it in the day of the Great Tribulation. You know, the time of the Great Tribulation is also known in the Scripture as the day of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. You know, the, the church, most uh, pre-tribulational people like myself believe the church will be raptured away from earth to be with Jesus. The nation of Israel, though, will remain to uh, finally come to faith, for one, and also to witness of God to all the world. And they, with all the other believing Gentiles that come to faith through their witness, they'll endure the days of hardship of the Great Tribulation. And when Jesus returns, they will rejoice. But the Scripture also tells us that they'll mourn. When writing of the future tribulation, the prophet Zechariah quotes God, the oracle of God, and he says this, Zechariah 12, verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for her firstborn. That's all in the context of the great tribulation. Now, part of this was fulfilled in Jesus' first coming, John 19, verse 34, but the rest is going to be fulfilled in his second coming. Israel will afflict themselves for how they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, though they can, of course, rejoice that they finally now, or at least will then know him in truth. All right. So the Day of Atonement, one more feast left. Verse 33, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. So this is the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. And it's Tishri day 15 through day 22. The Hebrew name you might recognize as Sukkoth. And it really refers to huts or shacks or temporary dwellings of, of some sort. We use the word tabernacle kind of interchangeably, but this is a different word than what's used for God's tabernacle in the midst of his people, his dwelling place. It was a different word altogether. It's really a different word than the typical word used for tent as well. This is referring to something far less stable. Um, but it's getting this idea across of these temporary dwellings. And somewhat, it we'll see here, even listed in the calendar, you can see somewhat equivalent to the Spring Festival on Unleavened Bread. This one also lasts a week, and there's some parallels. Just like Unleavened Bread has daily sacrifices, Tabernacles has daily sacrifices, with the exception that there's an eighth day. There's an additional sacrifice. See, to this point, the longest fest festival had lasted a week, Tabernacles was a week plus one day, eight days. So something new is being celebrated. Something new is being pictured among the, the nation of Israel. Uh, but it takes a little side note, verse 37. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on his day, Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. A little parenthetical note about all the feasts of Israel. Now, this was true for tabernacles, but this is true for all the feasts. Whatever it was that the feast required in terms of sacrifice, it was in addition to everything else that the people brought to the Lord. If something happened in somebody's life that they needed to bring a sin or a guilt offering, it wasn't put on hold until after whatever feast was going on. If someone needed to fulfill a vow that had begun prior to a feast beginning, it was fulfilled on the required day. They didn't postpone anything. 
all the national feasts were simply added to all the personal sacrifices of the people. What's the bottom line principle there? Corporate worship is no substitute for personal worship. Now, it's not that one of those things isn't necessary, right? They're both necessary. They're both good. It's sinful for a Christian to purposefully abstain from corporate worship when you look at the fact that he or she is supposed to be bringing his or her gifts to the Lord in order to bless the rest of the body as believers there. But it's just as wrong for a Christian to let, say, Sunday worship be the only worship that he or she ever offers to God. We're not Christians one or two days a week. We're always disciples of the Lord Jesus. We're always children of the Most High God. So we're to worship Him privately and publicly, to worship with Him individually, meet with Him individually, meet with Him corporately with the body of believers. Of course, God meets with us in both scenarios there. So that's all that's emphasized there. And then it goes back to the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 39, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the Feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day a Sabbath rest. You shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm leaves, the boughs of leafy trees, the willows of the brook. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You shall keep it as a feast of the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Now, although there's no regular or customary work done on the first or the eighth day, it doesn't mean that the Hebrews had nothing to do. They were to celebrate with palm branches and tree branches. Think of them like ancient pom-poms, uh, ancient you know, flags on poles. This is something they could wave around in the air as they're celebrating the Lord. It's a time of a lot of rejoicing. Again, you go from this day of atonement, from all this affliction and humbling, to this time of great rejoicing for eight full days. And in the picture is very similar to what comes to mind with Palm Sunday, but we got to remember that's a totally different time of year. Feast of Tabernacles takes place in the fall, as we can see there. But what we know today is Palm Sunday, which of course didn't come along until Jesus. Uh, that immediately preceded Passover, and that took place in the spring. But even so, the basic idea here is set forth of these leafy tree branches being used as tools of celebration. History shows from the book of Maccabees, actually, that they picked up the same idea, and they were celebrating their freedom when they won certain battles, and they waved these things around in the air. And that's a whole other preaching moment when we can get to Palm Sunday later on. Anyway, verse 42. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So tabernacles and booths is one of the only feasts, not the only one, one of the only feasts in Leviticus 23 with a specific reason given, Day of Atonement being the other. Uh, the people were to remember God's work of provision. God had provided for them in the wilderness, gave them food where there was none, gave them clothing that didn't wear out, gave them water in the desert. More than that, God was there, right? God dwelled among his people in the wilderness. He had his home, his tabernacle right there in their midst. They had booths. He had his tent. And this is a privilege, a privileged time that the people ought never to forget. And so we remember God's provision. We remember God's promise. And what did he promise for us? And what did he even promise for Israel as well? He promised them a kingdom. There will come a time in the future where we will dwell with Jesus just like God dwelled with his people. Jesus will be in our midst as our king just like God was in his, the midst of his people right in the center of their camp. And his united people, church and Israel, will come together. We will be his people. The millennial kingdom is going to be glorious. And the best part about the millennial kingdom is that it's only the beginning. Because the glories that start there, when Jesus is reigning and ruling among us, are going to be transformed and last into all eternity. Guys, God wants to meet with his people, so we want to meet with him. And he's given us the way to do it. He gave it here to Israel. He gave the Sabbath that they would would remember him regularly, so we remember Jesus regularly. Every opportunity we get, we rest in him. There's the spring feast where we remember what Jesus has done. He had Passover where we remember the cross and our redemption. There's unleavened bread where we remember Jesus' sinlessness and the righteousness that he's given us. 
We remember uh, first fruits, Jesus' resurrection, our resurrection to come because Jesus is risen from the grave. We remember Pentecost where Jesus gave the Spirit and He's empowered us to be His witnesses. Then there's those fall feasts where we think about what Jesus will do, the Feast of Trumpets and that future gathering, the, the rapture of the church where we'll go to meet our Jesus in the air. The Day of Atonement, this future affliction, but when Jesus comes back. And then, of course, tabernacles, when we will dwell forever with Him. Do you meet with God in worship? Regularly, do you remember what He's done? Do you remember His future promises? Are you putting time aside in your schedule with God? You know, that seems like such a minor thing, but it really has major impact in our lives, doesn't it? Because when we don't schedule time with God, it too easily goes away. You know, you think God gave everything for us when he gave us his son, Jesus. And when we put things like that into perspective, then we think, well, what's setting a few minutes aside every day for a daily devotional or a few hours a week for corporate worship? That seems so small in return. They're small amounts of time, but they're important amounts of time. These are the times we get to meet with our God. These are the times that we get into our prayer closets where we get to sit side by side with others and worship Him together when we join with the church in prayer. Those are powerful times, and we don't want to neglect them. And just by word of closing, one word of caution. You cannot meet with God unless you go through Jesus. Jesus said very clearly in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you've never done so before, you need to believe upon him for who he is, the crucified Son of God, risen from the grave, who offers to forgive you of your sins. And you can do that right now as we pray. Our Father, thank you so much for bringing us here and thank you, Lord, for this just cursory look through the feasts that you can show us how it points us to our Jesus, what Jesus has done, what he will continue to do in the future. Help us set aside time to meet with you. Seeing those few moments as the most valuable moments of our days. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.